How we doing everyone? Hope we're all good. So, part two of the Cristiano Ronaldo tell-all interview with Piers Morgan has now aired on Talk TV. Now, Piers Morgan said that we have to judge Ronaldo at the end of the interview. Okay, Piers, interview's out there. We now know all of the context, all of the history. Let's judge him. I did a video on the Ronaldo interview. It was a couple of days ago now. And I made some initial points based on my reaction from the snippets uh, that had been released from the Sun newspaper and online. And I still stand by those points. But I did say that until the full context and the background and everything had been released, and as Piers Morgan said, uh, let's reserve full judgment until now. Um, I'm going to break this down into sort of three segments. I'll quickly touch on Piers Morgan. Let's look at this from Cristiano Ronaldo's point of view. And then we can look at it from the other side, which is probably where most people looking at this are sitting from, where most football pundits have been sat from since the outset. Let's get started. So this interview has been, um, shall we say, promoted as a worldwide exclusive. Ronaldo's thoughts, something that he said he was going to do, I think as far back as August, he said he was going to reveal the truth and all the rest of it. We were expecting at some point down the line Ronaldo was going to say something. Then, of course, recently Piers Morgan said that he'd had this exclusive. Everyone was on the edge of their seat in excitement. And people like Gary Neville, ex-Manchester United player, now on Sky Sports all the time, they'd been clamouring for Ronaldo to give some sort of uh, opinion. And here he was. Interview was played over, over two nights, split into two, roughly equal 45-minute chunks. So let's look at it from Piers Morgan's point of view. Uh, Piers has interviewed Ronaldo before. It's pretty clear that he is a Ronaldo fanboy. He said many times, as part of massaging and nurturing Ronaldo's ego, that he considers Ronaldo the best player of the world, the best player of all time. When Ronaldo has previously spoken to Piers Morgan, Piers has very much sat and taken and accepted whatever Ronaldo has said. Where most hard-hitting journalists would come from, whether they're interviewing somebody who's famous in the world of sport, music, arts, politics, if somebody gives an answer, they'll normally ask follow-up questions or press them or push them home on certain points. And Piers Morgan is more of a sensationalist journalist. He's doing headline-grabbing uh, news stories. That's what that was. What his his shtick, shall we say, was all about when he was a newspaper editor. So Ronaldo knew that this was going to be not a pandering exercise, but it was going to be a much softer uh, sort of interview than somebody who's a little bit more hardball. Now, Piers Morgan says it was Ronaldo who reached out to him and asked for the interview. Piers Morgan is not going to say no. This is the coup of the decade. Ronaldo does not give many interviews. So to be able to have a widespread tell-all, almost like an American-style Oprah Winfrey sort of tell-all exclusive, like Harry and Meghan did, Piers Morgan, this is, this is a golden ticket for him. Some of the questions were good. Some of the questions were very, very soft. I said in my previous video that it looked like Piers Morgan was the one that was leading the conversation. Now that's to be expected. He's a serial and seasoned journalist who is sort of nitpicking for those kind of sound bites. He wants to cause the biggest amount of, of polarizing opinion as possible. So where Ronaldo, and of course partly because he's a sports person, he isn't as necessarily uh, astute as, say, Piers Morgan in the art of this type of conversation, but also because English is either his second or third language, so a little bit of broken English at times, uh, Piers would take a little snippet and then try and run down a particular avenue, try and just stir that pot a little bit more and extract whatever he could from Ronaldo. Um, at times, Ronaldo was a little bit stuttering and was trying to think of the right thing to say. Again, partly down to having to think and speak in English, and partly because he was trying to fill the gap that Piers Morgan was creating. Now, this is something that you have to expect in an interview like this. From Piers Morgan's perspective, he's extracted an awful lot of information 
that he would want. We've covered some softy bits, such as what's he going to do after the World Cup? What are his retirement plans? Is he looking for more children? Is he going to get married? What's his thoughts on Lionel Messi? And then he covered the more controversial points. Ex-teammates who have criticised him. Current and ex-managers. The club, the ownership. All of those things that we were waiting for those sound bites for. And he's done a pretty good job as you would expect from sort of a, a sensationalist style expose. So from Piers Morgan's perspective, if what he is saying is true, if what he is saying is that Ronaldo is the one who instigated this, he couldn't have done much more of a job in terms of what Piers Morgan is there to do. He, he isn't necessarily a Larry King style interviewer, Larry King who, um, famous interviewer over in the States for decades, who was quite hard hitting. Or somebody over here, a little bit like Jeremy Paxman, who are very droll and don't listen to the first or the second or the third answer. They keep hitting home that point. They don't buy or bite for the first sound bite that they give them. Uh, they, these are more of a hard hitter, more of a tougher interviewer. And Ronaldo knew, if what, with what we're led to believe is true, that he asked for the interview. He knew that this was going to be a softly, softly. So I think from that perspective... We couldn't have expected or asked for any more. That, that's been ticked as by what you would expect in terms of this kind of setup and who it was that was doing the interviewing. From Ronaldo's perspective, um, depending on whether or not you give half a stuff, there were a few points which we probably will gloss over for the purpose of this review. He was talking a little bit about marriage. He was talking a little bit about more children. He was talking a little bit about retirement plans. He was talking a little bit about messy. I mean, these aren't really controversial, super interesting things. He's always come across when he talks about fellow professionals as a fairly respectful kind of guy. Whenever he's been sat with Messi or talking about Messi, he's always shown respect for Messi. He's always looked to try and introduce his son, Cristiano Junior, to, uh, to Messi. The understanding is that Cristiano Junior loves Messi, like most football fans do. He's always appeared to be respectful and cordial before and after matches when they've been at galas and dinners and celebratory events or if they've just passed each other in the tunnel there's always been mutual respect there nothing's really changed uh, when it came to participation at the world cup chasing down records that motivation that desire that hunger these are all things that we knew about ronaldo in the sort of the snippets that we've had down the years when people who have played with him worked with him have given their opinions on him. He's an extremely talented, extremely driven individual. He has that same kind of desire that somebody like a Roy Keane had, or somebody like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have, when you want to be absolutely supreme in your field, you are almost unrelenting in that pursuit of setting those standards and attaining those standards and maintaining those standards. During the interview, he spoke a lot about longevity, it's not enough to, to look to get to that summit. It's staying at that summit and not accepting coming down from that summit, putting every ounce of, of passion, hunger, desire, work rate, leaving no stone unturned to maintain that level. He spoke a little bit about his relationship with his girlfriend. And again, for the, for the purpose of this, I'm not going to dwell too much on, on these points. So fairly chronologically spanning the two parts then. The first part was quite soft, really. Um, there were some elements where you don't necessarily begrudge him giving his opinion on them. When David Beckham was at the height of his fame with Manchester United, which was sort of between, say, 1999 and 2002, where he would married Posh Spice, they were Posh and Bex, they were starting their family, he had fragrances and sunglasses and his business interests, that celebrity world, much to the chagrin of Sir Alex Ferguson, was becoming a huge material concern. He was opening the doors for, you know, what we see with Paul Pogba, what we see with Cristiano Ronaldo now. He was that, that flag bearer, if you like. He walked the path before anyone else did. He gave interviews. He appeared on things like, I think it was Comic Relief. He did a sit-down interview with Ali G. So it wasn't as if Ronaldo's the first footballer, super high-profile global phenomenon to sit down and give an interview uh, this has happened before the initial points that he spoke about were more opinion based not so much a knife in the back uh he spoke a little bit 
about the Manchester City links. He has to, because when he was at Juventus and when it first appeared that he was going to leave, Manchester City were the, the, the front runners. They were the ones who'd made a concrete offer. They contacted his agent, George Mendes. They contacted the player. We don't know as to what level of detail uh, they were at, what stage of negotiations. Piers Morgan didn't really want to stir that fire at all. Ronaldo said that they were close. Not, not super close, but close. So that probably means they'd had a discussion. The bare bones of a contract had probably been put in front of him. We don't know what would have happened with Erling Haaland. We knew that uh, City had a long-standing interest in the player. We knew that they were looking for a striker, possibly as a stopgap, or possibly if the release clause was going to be a stumbling block. They'd looked at Harry Kane, and that was very close. Obviously, they were now looking at Ronaldo. Does that mean that they were looking to get rid of Gabriel Jesus? Does that mean that there was a potential complication in them getting Haaland? We don't know. Were they looking at Ronaldo as a one-season stopgap before Haaland became available? Don't know. These are all sort of points that really I would have loved to have been explored in the interview a little bit more. But what we do know, according to Ronaldo, which City have not denied, by the way, is that this deal was potentially close. Manchester United came in very, very late. Ronaldo said something along the lines of it was a 72-hour period when United made their intentions clear to when he signed for them. It was a very quick sort of swoop and grab type uh, situation. The next point that they moved on to was partly as to why he rejected Manchester City. It was an interesting one because during his time at Real Madrid, he seemed to have a very frosty, antagonistic relationship with Pep Guardiola. There was quite a lot of petulance between the two of them on the touchline during El Clasico matches. If they went to gala dinners, you know, Ronaldo tried to be cordial and it looked like Guardiola was quite frosty to Ronaldo. We know that there's a huge rivalry between Madrid and Barcelona. Also, in terms of the styles and philosophies of how they approach football, Eric Ten Hag is more of a, a Guardiola-esque type manager. And it would appear that the style of football and the philosophy and the demeanour is at odds. We'll come on to that point later. So it's interesting that Ronaldo was seriously considering and was close playing for a Guardiola type manager, i.e. Guardiola. So I found that an interesting one. Um, given his history with Manchester United, and he did touch on that during the interview, that he said his history was written with United, for him to be so close to joining City, that's an interesting point as well. Why he didn't join? Was there a problem with Guardiola? We don't know. But he seems to suggest that Sir Alex Ferguson's input, which was widely reported at the time, was a major contributing factor to him choosing United over City. Was there a monetary difference? Was there a promised role? We'll come on to that point potentially later. Or was it merely when Ferguson says, listen boy, you will not be playing for City, and Ronaldo goes, yes boss. Was it as simple as that? We don't know. Piers Morgan didn't really want to stir that either. So all we know is that there was a potential deal on the table or a close option to joining Manchester City and Sir Alex Ferguson's involvement late in the day helped swing it and he joined Manchester United. He said he made a very conscious decision, although it was predominantly an emotional one, not a rational one, to join Manchester United. So United are not a big player right now on the pitch. They are not competitive. They're not in the final runnings looking to win major trophies. They are behind City and Liverpool and Arsenal and a host of other continental clubs. So he was thinking from the heart rather than what was for the good of his career right now in terms of competing for honours right now. I don't think there's a problem in saying that really. If he said anything to the contrary, he probably would be lying and I think that's probably worse. The next part of the interview focused on how he found the club. Um, he's, now he's now rejoined, um, he scored a couple of goals on his debut and Piers asks him what state does he find the club in compared to how he left it. The first point that he went on was, obviously he's been away for a number of years, he's been at Real Madrid, he's been at Juventus. He said that the facilities hadn't changed. The pool, the jacuzzi, the gym, the training ground, 
training methods, a lot of the backroom staff, the chefs, all that kind of thing. Their approach to nutrition, their approach to things like recuperation, preparation. He suggested that other clubs have moved forward with the times, whether that is sports psychology, cryogenic chambers, Real Madrid, they've got these special sleeping pods where you can exert some energy and then do a power nap and all sorts of clever things like that. He seemed to suggest that United have been left in other teams' wake. That may be true. The next thing that he started talking about was the transfers and the stature of playing staff from when he left to what he's found when he's come back. And there's two parts to this. When he left in 2009, you had one of the best goalkeepers in the world in Edwin van der Sar. You still had players like Gary Neville. Yes, there was Wes Brown also as a right back. Rio Ferdinand. Uh, Nemanja Vitic, uh, Michael Carrick, Paul Scholes, Ryan Giggs, Berbatov, Rooney, Tevez. United did have a who's who at the time of terrific talent. You had senior pros, been there, done it, got the t-shirt, but demanded that those standards are maintained. A decent level of first team players. And then some decent youth players, you know, with, with potential to come through. And this was a team that only accepted competing for every major honour. Two European finals in three years. Um, might have been more than that. I think it was actually three European finals in four years. Um, in terms of the Champions League. Um, they had competed for the Premier League pretty much every single season. I think they'd won three, three Premier Leagues in a row at the time he left. So they were one of the, one of the very, very best teams in Europe probably the team to beat in the Premier League. Standards were up here, facilities were up here. There we are. Fast forward to when he comes back and those playing standards have dropped. You don't have that, that creme de la creme of senior pro who have been there and done it and won it. You could argue <clears throat> that in the last few years that the only senior pros that United have had of that level of expectation where the demand for excellence, longevity, maintenance of standards would be the likes of Wayne Rooney, the likes of Zlatan Ibrahimovic when he was there, you're probably struggling to find anyone else in all honesty. So this is almost like a cultural reset. You need to get back to that multiple tier of squad structure. That's what Alex Ferguson used to talk about a lot. The senior pros demanding excellence. The prime first team players in their mid to late 20s who are the driving force of a team. And then the younger players, the late teens, early 20s, those who are knocking on the door or are spursed in and around the experienced players. That constant sort of flow, that usurping. It's what the class of 92 did to the likes of Paul Ince and Brian Robson and Mark Hughes and, and that calibre. And it's what the team that he assembled sort of 2007 to 2009, that kind of era did as well. And so Ronaldo represents that senior level. He is the Rio Ferdinand, the Edwin van der Sar, the Ryan Giggs, the Paul Scholes level now. Then they bring in somebody like a Rafa Varane, serial winner from Spain, multiple time cap for France. He's won, I think he's won the, the World Cup with France, multiple Champions Leagues, multiple La Ligas. Then they bring in Casemiro, same could be said for him because of his time with Real Madrid. They bring in Jadon Sancho, an extremely talented, exciting youngster. And he's thinking, looking at this, with a core team, with this sprinkling of world-class uh, stardust on the top, what he's trying to say is we now need to start that, that mentality, that excellence, that accepting nothing else other than first place type mentality. It's what we were talking about earlier in, in the video. It sounds like he was expecting a top four challenge at the very least with that sprinkling of excellence. And then, of course, the conversation shifts to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. We know, being ex-playing colleagues for a few seasons, that he took Ole's departure in a, in a big way, in a big negative way. But like any player who comes to a football club where you have a director of football or a manager, if somebody departs who was instrumental in bringing you to the football club, whether you wanted to play for them, whether you were sold <clears throat> on a dream by them, if they then leave shortly afterwards, all players in that kind of boat would feel similar. 
then he was asked of course he touched a little bit on Michael Carrick coming in in a caretaker capacity then he was of course asked about the Ralph Ranick situation there is an element of honesty here which I think a lot of Manchester United fans and football fans probably would agree with United clearly didn't have a plan or a vision he was a stopgap they thought they could bring somebody of his ilk in in a short space of time and then move him upstairs as a sort of a consultant and what Ronaldo was saying was over the last 10 years or so this guy is a sporting director hasn't been hands-on coach for a number of years now he is a hands-on coach the gig and pressing that the likes of Tuchel the likes of Julian Nagelsmann and the likes of Jurgen Klopp have adopted he is the godfather of this putting his hand around players and coming up with individual ways to um, train and improve their ability tactically technically how they receive the ball the positions that they take up where they're going to be with and without the ball these are all sort of I don't want to say revelations or innovations that he came up with but these are certainly things that have been attributed to him as part of the modern game certainly in German football so having somebody who is very hands-on in comparison to what he's been used to with Fernando Santos with Max Allegri Sir Alex Ferguson if you want to go back that far Zinedine Zidane and Carlo Ancelotti these these guys super successful as they are have teams with them where the management team the coaching team divides groups trading exercises short medium long-term goals of how they want to improve the individual and the collective and normally you have a like a godfather type moment where a Sir Alex or a Carlo Ancelotti or someone like that is standing and observing always taking that information in whether it be way back in their office just observing the training pitch or just standing at the side of the training pitch taking it all in but not necessarily putting the cones down and putting the arm around the player and giving the feedback Ranić did that that's a, a culture change but it's also coming from a guy that he doesn't respect a guy that he's never heard of doesn't understand what his credentials are you are a guy who's down here I am Cristiano Ronaldo up here how dare you speak to me like this he did later say that he's an extremely humble guy he doesn't think that he knows more or less about football than anyone else and he doesn't expect anyone to know more or less about football than him yet the way that he spoke about Ralph Ranić didn't really impart that but he was just airing his opinion and what he's trying to say is a club like Manchester United who's trying to compete at the very top they've sacked a manager whether you agree with it or not they've sacked the manager what is the plan and it appeared like there wasn't one they needed a stopgap they needed somebody to get them through to the end of the season rather than getting a coach who was out of work at least Solskjaer when he was appointed had been a successful coach in Norway with Mould it's not like they just plucked him after retiring saying do you want to have a go he did have a little bit of an experience he'd done well at mold gone to cardiff didn't go great went back to mold did well then got his opportunity with ralph ranick as a sort of a a club sporting director who hadn't been hands-on as a coach or a manager ronaldo didn't agree with that appointment it's almost as if he was trying to say again talking about another of his ex playing colleagues why not give michael carrick the job as he'd done all right in his couple of games with Ralph Ranić above him so it didn't seem like he had too much of a of an axe to grind with Ranić as a sporting director but it was the fact that he was appointed as the coach and that he had to call him boss when he didn't feel like he deserved it didn't have the respect the kudos the gravitas the resume to warrant that that's where that seemed to fall apart and then he started talking about Ranić uh, publicly criticising Ronaldo and suggesting perhaps he shouldn't uh, stay at the football club we don't know if there's any truth in the rumours that Rania and Tuchel who have remained close didn't have a conversation I did a video regarding Graham Potter at Chelsea go check that out I'll put the link in the description where there were rumours that Tuchel and Rania spoke and even though the owner of Chelsea Todd Bowley wanted Cristiano Ronaldo this this summer just gone Tuchel said no partly because Ronaldo brings all that razzmatazz and circus with him and partly as the rumor goes because of the advice and feedback Ranić had given him so it's almost as if Ronaldo was blaming Ranić for scuppering his opportunity to move to Chelsea we don't know if there's any truth in that but that is one of the rumors that have, that has been circulating certainly they didn't get on so 
it sounds like he hasn't got a huge amount of respect for the club in its current situation. The facilities are no good. Didn't seem to think much of the playing squad. Didn't think much of their decision to get rid of Oli. Didn't think much of their decision with regards to his replacement, Raf Ranić. Conversation then shifts to younger players. And he tries to talk a bit about the change in younger players now compared to younger players in his time. There's always going to be an element of churn. There's going to be generational differences. The class of 92, the Barcelona class, which had Xavi and Puyol and Victor Valdez, Iniesta, that period would have been slightly different. And then the period of Cristiano Ronaldo, which is him and Messi and those guys. Each one of those, even though they're only probably five or six years apart, there will be cultural differences. The amount of money, the opportunity available to them, the technology at their fingertips. In this country, we used to have the YTS scheme where youth players were almost like apprentices. They used to have to clean the boots of the older players. Now they're coming into the first team 16, 17, 18 as the hottest thing since sliced bread. They don't have to get on their hands and knees and scrub the old, the, the old players' boots. That doesn't happen anymore. So there is a, a, a sense of entitlement, a sense of fast tracking, which didn't really happen in his day. That's true. There's the social media side. Everyone gets the opportunity from a commercial perspective much sooner than ever before. Players are signed to multi-year sponsorship deals, endorsement deals, social media opportunities. The moment they've made their senior debut. That didn't happen in his day. And what he's looking at, I think he's, he's trying to make the point that we've seen with, say, Deli Ali, that when these things are being thrown at them, their focus away from being a footballer, a professional sports person, is shifted. His focus has always been, I am a footballer. I am an athlete first. What I do to look after myself, no alcohol, no partying, no tattoos, my diet, my nutrition, my rest recuperation, my primary focus is on that longevity, getting to the standard, maintaining that standard. Everything else will come off the back of my success, my accolades and my achievements. If he was unsure, he would ask a senior pro. If the senior pro didn't want to give him advice, whether it was Roy Keane, Scholes, Giggs, which was do as I do, not as I say, or do as I say, but not as I do, whatever the advice was, how they looked after themselves. First one on the training pitch, last one off. What do they do in the gym? What do they do in terms of diet, nutrition? What do they do in terms of sports psychology? Rio Ferdinand had a lot of physical problems later in his career. He and Edwin van der Sar and Ryan Giggs, as they got into their mid and late 30s, did a lot of yoga. Ronaldo has embraced all of these kind of things. He spoke so many times about longevity, mentality, hunger, desire. That it's not about money for him. Money and all the other things are the benefits that will come with his hard work, his dedication, his application to his profession. And what he was indicating was, or implying, that the young players don't seem as focused or as driven as he was. That they're happy to accept that their careers will peter out sooner than his. They don't seem to want it as bad, is I think what he was trying to say. It's almost as if they don't ask for advice, or they don't just by default look at somebody like him and want to copy him in the way that he did with senior pros in his day. Now, of course, the money that's available now, in terms of how much and much sooner, means that if they come from a poor background, perhaps they want to just look after themselves and their family, and that's enough for them. That's possible as well. But he seemed to express a dissatisfaction that some of the younger players at United, talented as he probably thinks they are, are not doing enough with their talent, not working hard enough to maximise that that potential and, and, and maximising that longevity. He didn't mention Mason Greenwood at all, but he's potentially someone he might also be insinuating in this. He didn't mention Marcus Rashford, but he's also somebody that he might be insinuating as part of this, where their social wars that they've been looking to do, and obviously the unfortunate situation with Mason Greenwood off the pitch, has distracted and got in the way of them potentially doing more with the talent they've got now. It was quite interesting. Um, he may even have some valid points in that regard. Um, when it then came on to, well, what is the advice then? One of the few times that Piers Morgan did actually ask a follow-up question. Ronaldo's advice was, look at me. I'm the best player in the world. I've got longevity, my standards, my expectations, what I give of myself and to, and to my teammates. Copy me. Get to the training ground earlier. Leave the training ground later. Go to the gym. 
Focus on the mind. Focus on the well-being. Ask me if you're unsure. He said he wasn't a massive communicator, but that doesn't mean that if somebody didn't come up to him and say, hey, can you give me inv some advice, that he wouldn't do that. I think he was just a little bit disappointed that somebody of his stature, with his success, his longevity in the game, is perhaps not being utilised as much by the young players. It's something he certainly would have done. He potentially has a point there. The next thing that he moved on to, and this, this had some personal um, sort of ramifications for myself, was we know towards the end of last season, Ronaldo and his girlfriend were expecting twins. And unfortunately, uh, one of those twins um, passed away, didn't make it through um, childbirth. He had a boy and a girl, I believe the girl they've named Bella. And unfortunately, the boy uh, did not survive. I can tell you from personal experience uh, what a horrific situation and ordeal that is. Uh, so five years ago, almost exactly five years ago, I already had two girls who were aged three and one, and I was expecting a third daughter. And unfortunately, due to some complications, the expected birth date had to be brought forward. And due to some other complications, she unfortunately did not survive childbirth. And much like Cristiano, uh, she was given a name. Her name is Lacey. And very similarly to Cristiano, uh, she had a funeral. So we registered her. We got the, the handprints and the, and the footprints that you can get. Um, the hospital maternity wards are really, really good uh, in situations like this. Uh, we had a funeral. She was cremated. Uh, we kept her ashes and what we've done is introduced her to the children by way of a sort of like a family stuffed animal. So wherever the children are living, they have their sister with them. They can pr have some sort of visual concept of her presence being with them. We said, or it was explained to them by um, grandparents, myself, that when you pass away, old or young, you become a star in the sky. So Lacey has a star. Lacey lives with them. I've made a conscious effort to make sure that they recognize and, and include her when they talk about their family so that they each say that they have two sisters. Um, and it is, it's, it is a horrific ordeal. Nothing prepares you for that because when you go through childbirth, you expect it to be fine. You don't expect complications. Um, and it, it massively affects you in ways that I can't even begin to articulate. It's different for different people. I'm sure most people watching and listening to this have experienced loss of close people to them. Grief affects you in many different ways. Neurologically, physically, emotionally. It's, uh, it's, it's very, very tough. And it's very unjust when a parent survives a child. And I don't think there's a, a softer way or a way of softening the loss. Some people try to uh, quantify it by saying the younger they are, perhaps the softer the blow because they didn't have, you didn't have an opportunity to build up as much of a relationship over as many years. I think that's bullshit. It's a travesty that the younger they are, the less time they've had to build a life for themselves. I just think it doesn't matter what age you are. When a parent loses a child, it's very personal and unique to them as a person, to their situation, to their family, to their makeup. And I can tell you that in addition to general feelings of grief that most people would feel, you can become physically ill, very much like stress, a lack of appetite so you don't eat, not drinking. You almost become not just apathetic or lethargic, 
you can become depressed, you can become physically unwell, no energy. It's almost like you're fading away. And it can be very difficult to find meaning and joy and positivity in your life. Sometimes you have to have like a mind over matter type moment where you look at your other children if you have them. In the case of Cristiano, he had several, plus of course Bella did survive. In my case, I had two other daughters. Sometimes you just have to force yourself to be there for them. They haven't done anything wrong. They need you. And sometimes you just have to get on with it. Um, what was also quite striking, and again, I don't want to go too much, grief, how you're affected by grief, especially in your line of work. That's a very personal, unique thing. Uh, in my circumstance, five months after uh, Lacey unfortunately passed, uh, four months after um, she had her funeral, my eldest daughter um, suffered a very, very bad sort of infection. She had a sort of a flu, and within the space of 12 hours, she'd gone from just being in a fair amount of pain that you would expect to be if you had a bad case of the flu, to suffering a, sig a very severe bout of pneumonia brought on by this initial infection. She was put into an induced coma and was hospitalised for over a month, went through multiple blood transfusions, and it was touch and go as to whether or not she was going to make it through. So in the space of five months, I'd lost my youngest daughter, didn't get a chance for her to hold my finger for the first time or anything of that nature, and I was faced with the real prospect of losing my eldest so I can relate to what Cristiano was going through, although I think he said from the interview, if I remember correctly, it was about a three month period from when <clears throat> his son unfortunately passed away at, at childbirth to when Bella, I think he was on holiday in Mallorca, when she was hospitalized with bronchitis. Very similar sort of situation, uh, very similar circumstance. And I can tell you that the confusion that he was feeling about you have to love and appreciate and have joy for the daughter who was born and the children that he still has because every child is a blessing compared to the grief and the sorrow and the loss it's very conflicting it's very difficult and then it's compounded by that emotional stress that you go through when your child is faced with um, you know hospitalization and is then fighting for their life it was actually quite striking for me watching that because it runs in parallel with what I went through five years ago. Um, so yeah, that, that was quite an emotional moment for me. And I can certainly tell anyone who's watching now, I have no issue with Ronaldo talking about his feelings about joining Manchester United, the joy he felt about making his debut, expressing his loss so that they understand what he was going through at the back end of last season expressing the difficulty that he had just prior to pre-season with his daughter being ill. None of that I have any issue with. I actually think he should be applauded for discussing something so personal and powerful as that sort of level of loss. I think that is not easy. I can tell you it's not easy. So for him to be in front of a camera, I have nothing but respect for him to talk about that. He said... That obviously with what was going on with Bella, plus I can also say that he would have not healed. His grieving process would still have been ongoing in regards to, because it's only been three months, I think, since they'd lost his son. Uh, to, to state that that was a reason for him not to go to pre-season, that is a personal decision. And your perspective does change when something like this happens. If he picks up the phone and says to one of the Glazers or to Eric Ten Hag or Richard Arnold or whoever it is that he has to speak to and say, my daughter is ill, she's fighting for her life, I cannot join you on pre-season. As an employer or somebody on the side, if somebody said that to me, I would 100% be, yep, you do what you need to do. If there is a paperwork exercise that needs to be completed for like a roll call or whatever, Cristiano, would you mind just sending us some form of hospital admission thing? Great, take a picture from your phone, send it, done so that could have been a box ticked very very quickly i have no issue with him being late for pre-season 
or not attending pre-season if he needs to be at home and look after the well-being of his family. That is number one priority for everyone. Manchester City did the same thing for David Silva. He had a son. Uh, his son, I think, is, is it is it Matteo? Manchester City fans will be able to correct me if I'm wrong. He had complications at birth. He needed to be hospitalised. Pep Guardiola basically said, you put your, your boots down, you fuck off back to Spain, you stay in Spain, you be there for your family, you don't think about football, do not come back until that child is okay. And I believe Manchester United probably would have done something similar to Cristiano Ronaldo, given that he's just lost one of his twins and the other twin is now fighting for her life. Ronaldo said that... And he didn't really explain this and Piers Morgan didn't really press him for this, but he seemed to imply that the United hierarchy didn't believe him when he said that Bella was hospitalised. If that's true, that's a fucking travesty. That is an absolute disgrace if that is true. Flip side is if they had requested something from an audit trail perspective or just so that they could say, look, for our perspective, from our side, as part of an attendance, as part of a roll call, could you take a picture of a hospitalisation docket, which is what you get when you are under care, file it away, job done, you take as long as you need. That could have put that issue to bed. We don't know what was said between who to who at that time. It's impossible to make a comment as to whether Manchester United did disrespect him, whether they didn't believe him. We don't know. I would like to think, as a fair and equal employer, Manchester United would have gone, do you know what? You take all the time you need, off you pop. United released a statement around that time saying that Ronaldo had been given permission for compassionate grounds not to join up on pre-season. I'd like to think that public message was reciprocated in private and that they believed him. If they didn't, he's justified to say that that is a disgrace on part of Manchester United. If it's untrue, this will just add to the furore caused by Cristiano Ronaldo. Um... He, he spoke also about the pressure that he'd been under. I don't want to comment on his relationship. That's a personal thing. I can tell you, of course, it does cause undue pressure and stress on any relationship that you have, whether it's with a partner, whether it's with your parents, whether it's with your children because you're, you're bottling things in, whether it's with work colleagues or friends. It's, it's, it's very difficult to put a mask on and bottle that up and be yourself or be professional and try and do your job. It's extremely difficult. The fact that he came back and performed to a high level consistently at all, I have nothing but respect for that. He opened the lid a little bit on some of the difficulties and I, I can only, I've not been in his situation in terms of the high profile nature of what he is performing in front of thousands of people, millions of people on the football pitch, which by definition opens you up for criticism all the time. I can't tell you how difficult it is. I can only tell you that in my line of work, whether I'm working for someone, when I'm working for myself, I found it unbelievably difficult to focus for a long time. Um, so to lift the lid there, nothing but respect. Um, I don't really have anything negative to say. He's talking about from a personal perspective. He's trying to explain why his involvement, participation, level, focus, motivations... Might, why they might change. These are human um, emotions. Nothing but respect for that. Uh, he spoke about his son's ashes. I've told you what we've done with our daughter's ashes. It's a beautiful thing to have it in the house. I'm not a big fan of just having urns on the mantelpiece, but that's his decision. It's nice that the ashes and the family is complete. I like that. Um, he spoke a little bit about some of the criticism he's faced, whether that has come from the fans, whether it's come from Wayne Rooney specifically, where it's come from Gary Neville. It's that kind of thing is a, a double-edged sword. I've got mixed feelings about that because yes, anytime that you become high profile, if you're going in front of a camera or you're going to go into a field which is in the public domain, you are going to get criticised. Is that fair? Some people say it comes with the territory. But if you are Training to be an actor, if you dream of being on the stage or in front of a camera or kicking a ball about whatever it is that you're doing, you don't dream about being criticised on E! News or on Sky Sports. You dream about winning the World Cup, winning the Champions League, winning an Oscar, whatever it might be. That's, that's your dream. 
it's difficult to say to people that just because you're in the public eye, you must accept the criticism, especially if it's coming from people that you thought were your friends. He said that Rooney had come to his house to collect his son. And I appreciate that that in itself doesn't mean that you're friends and that doesn't mean you can't be criticised by them. If I'm a fucking prick, I expect my friends or family to tell me that I'm a fucking prick. I do think some of the criticism was justified. Some of it perhaps is a little bit over the top. It's difficult for him to, to argue against that because of who he is and the fact he's on the Instagrams and all the socials and all the rest of it. So he... He can't have his cake and eat it in that regard. I don't have too much to say when it comes to the Gary Neville or Wayne Rooney criticisms. They are pundits, whether they go over the top, whether they do it like Piers Morgan's doing this interview. That is it's very subjective. Um, it doesn't really say too much about what the football fans want to see in this interview. So I think let's just gloss over that. He's going to receive criticism. He doesn't feel it's justified. He feels a bit betrayed. Some people will support him, some people won't. Not really an awful lot more to add to that that has, than has already been said. One of the items which was quite interesting was he spent a bit of time talking about the early leaving from Old Trafford and the whole substitute kind of debacle which happened. So in pre-season, United were playing Rayo Vallecano and he said that in the previous season uh, and at that game, I believe as well, multiple players left early. It's not a serious match, but he was the only one whose name was, was brought to light that they'd left early. He felt that he was being victimised there. He felt he was being unduly singled out, which may or may not be true. Did he have the manager's permission to leave early? Well, if multiple players left, did they all just break rank? Or did the manager say, nah, it's pre-season. Fuck off if you're not going to play or if you've already come off. We don't know. So he may have a point in that particular instance, but the club haven't said anything to the contrary. So the fact that multiple players left, did they all get disciplined? Did they all have to stand up and apologise? We don't know. If the answer to that is no, then he probably does have a point to say, well, what's going on here? If the answer is that they all broke rank, well, that doesn't make him any less bad just because there was more people doing it. He then spoke about the whole substitute thing. So this goes back to Manchester United playing Manchester City at Etihad Stadium in the Manchester Derby. And if you're a Manchester United fan, it was a fucking humiliation. At one stage, they were losing 6-1. I think Anthony Martial scored two late consolation goals to bring some level of respectability there. It finished 6-3. Now, towards the end of the game, United were making some substitutions. Ten Hag did not bring Ronaldo on. Now... The official excuse is they didn't want to bring disrespect to Ronaldo's career by bringing him on. So Ten Hag might have thought that, that situation was futile. City are going to win. United will not get anything out of the game. No point bringing Ronaldo on and asking him to run around at 37 years of age. Maybe pull a hammy. Who knows? When that game is gone, move on to something else. So Ronaldo didn't seem to express too much issue with that. The game is lost. They're going to get smashed. Rather than bring him on and waste uh, his, his energy in a futile chase, save him for another day. All right. Where he does seem to have a problem is the Tottenham game a few weeks later. The Tottenham game, United are winning 2-0. Arguably the most complete performance that United have put in under Ten Hag at that point in time. Looking to close the game out, whether that's to add solidarity or a like for like, or to run the clock down, with just a few minutes left to go, I think it was the 88th or the 90th minute, a few minutes of stoppage time as well. Eric Ten Hag signalled that he wanted to bring Ronaldo on. Ronaldo, according to the footage, insinuated that he did not want to come on. Not too dissimilar to the Carlos Tevez situation with Roberto Mancini a few years ago. To add fuel to the fire, Ronaldo then walked off down the tunnel before full time. It's then of the understanding that he left Old Trafford early, the only person in the playing squad to do that. He felt that Eric Ten Hag was a hypocrite and had disrespected him and had provoked him in this particular instance. He couldn't understand why in the Manchester derby, when they're losing 6-1, and he doesn't want to bring him on out of respect, to now, when the game is probably won, why does he want to bring Ronaldo on now for the same last couple of minutes? He felt that that was a public humiliation and he felt he was being provoked. He said, although he couldn't be 100% honest, more likely than not, that he regretted leaving the stadium early. 
He then gave some kind of insinuation that he had made an apology for that. But he felt very strongly that Ten Hag was the architect of this, that there was hypocrisy going on there, and he felt completely disrespected and humiliated. That's why he reacted in the way that he did. Although generally, he did seem to show some form of regret for that. He stated that since this point in time, his relationship with Eric Ten Hag has deteriorated. Neither has respect for the other, and it sounds like it's gone to the point of no return. He said that there's no empathy. I don't respect him. He doesn't respect me. I can't hold respect in my heart for somebody who doesn't hold respect for me, and so on and so forth. He's using that Tottenham scenario as the catalyst for subsequent potential criticisms that Ten Hag might have said in public or the fact he hasn't started many games as a breakdown of a relationship. It's got similarities there to what Ibrahimovic said about Pep Guardiola when he was at Barcelona. Why buy a Ferrari if you're going to drive it like a Fiat, I believe is what he said. He spoke a little bit about his surprise, uh, almost finding it hilarious that he was suspended for the first time in his career that his son Cristiano Jr. found that hilarious as well, almost like a bad boy at school. Uh, he sounded very sarcastic when he was talking about that. This did sound quite disrespectful in the way that he was coming across. But then again, this is from his point of view, feeling victimised now. He spoke a little bit about his future after the World Cup. That doesn't really matter too much. He's, we've known that he wants to play for another few years. I think 40 has always been an aim of his didn't rule it out but it does sound like this is going to be his last world cup Piers morgan did say look if you continue banging in the goals you'll only be 41 at the next one so that's a watch this space moment if he scores a hat trick in the final he will retire i think he did say that <laughs> he's well aware that this interview is going to bring more criticism to him he doesn't seem to have an issue with that and as part of that he went on the attack about the glazers he said that they are bad owners. He said that they don't care about the football club, that they don't really understand football. Piers Morgan was talking about Manchester United fans' feelings that they suck all the money out of the football club, that they don't put the money back in. The training facilities, the leaking roof, the lack of investment in the playing personnel to maintain consistent challenges with Liverpool and City and others. Ronaldo seemed to echo that. He seemed to publicly slate the owners he said he'd never spoken to any of them, Joel Glazer or anyone of that of that stature. And he insinuated that the focus of Manchester United had changed. They are no longer the winner all costs bear moth that they were before, where they were infatuated and demanded to be top of the tree. And that's what he said that Manchester United should be. That is their place. But that the current ownership model, this will never happen. They're not going to put their hand in their pocket. The model is not geared around being a football club first and business second. And I think part of that and part of the mercenary element of football we've seen with Neymar and others, he said that football for him now is less of a passion. It's now more a business. And I think the way he's conducting himself is he is the commodity. He is the asset and he is going to look after and to protect that asset. And I think that's part of what this is, that longevity, maximising the potential, maximising his chances of, of winning, gearing the situation as he wants it, as his career winds down. That is a huge element, a huge part of how and why he's constructed this interview. That was quite telling. It shows now he's separating the emotional element of Manchester United to the business rationale element of Cristiano Ronaldo. So they were the main points from his side. From the other side of the fence now, most pundits, most experts, most football fans are of the opinion that Ronaldo wasn't right to do this. They find it disrespectful and all the rest of it. As I said earlier, David Beckham and other high profile players have done sit down interviews in the past when they were at the height of their fame. So for Ronaldo to do this, I don't necessarily think by default is a bad thing. It's been demanded by people like Gary Neville and others that if there was grumblings going on over the summer that Ronaldo should speak. So he has. So he was damned if he did and damned if he didn't. So I think respect and fair play to the fact that he's done that. 
there's a couple of things which I'm going to ignore. We spoke about some of his uh, personal circumstance. No need to talk about any further about obviously his loss. No need to talk about his personal relationships. Not really too interested about when he's going to retire. Not really too interested about the World Cup. More interested in about the interview and its content. Um, something which doesn't sit right with me. Doesn't matter who made the request to who out of those two. There was a game. Manchester United were travelling to Fulham. Midweek, they said to Ronaldo that he wouldn't start, but he was going to be part of the squad. The match day squad, usually around 18 players. Ronaldo replied, I'm ill. I am too ill to travel. I'm too ill to participate. Yet at this material time, he then has a sit-down interview with Piers Morgan. He looked pretty well and fit and in good health to me. So that doesn't look great on Ronaldo. The timing couldn't have been worse. The distribution and the promotion of the video also was ill-advised. United won in a very Ferguson-esque manner. It's actually a habit that's beginning to happen under Eric Ten Hag, showing a United fighting spirit that's beginning to materialise under him, just like the Fergie years. They won with a 93rd minute winner from their latest young starlet, Alejandro Garnacho. I've made a short video about him and how he might become United's next starlet. Link in the description. And the fact that this was his first Premier League goal, and he's starting to make a name for himself consistently for Manchester United, the fact that there was all this buzz now about the interview has taken a bit of the gloss and shine and limelight away from this young player. I thought that was a bit ill-advised. So the actual distribution and timing of the interview, given the excuses that he gave and the fact that Garnacho had earned the, the, the right to be appraised for what, he, for what he'd accomplished, I think just it didn't sit right with me and I don't think it sat right with a few others. Um, on to the points within the interview itself. Criticism about the coaches, criticism about pundits, criticism about X professionals who have criticised him. You know, those kind of complaints that he raised in the interview. Um, he is a sensitive but also thick-skinned individual. He didn't seem to understand the criticism from the likes of Wayne Rooney or Gary Neville, and he seemed to insinuate that they needed to know the truth before making any kind of judgment. Well, now that they do, it'll be interesting to see what that judgment is. I happen to think both of them will stand by their comments. So it'd be interesting to see if he still feels victimised or if they explain themselves, can he pause and reflect and see where they're coming from? His, his criticism of the sacking of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, yes, they're friends. He's the manager who brought him to the club. You can understand that to a certain degree. I think... United's performances weren't great under Solskjaer, their consistency wasn't great under Solskjaer, they lacked that something to get them over the line in major finals or semi-finals. There was a tactical naivety around Solskjaer. Now whether that's because that is him, or whether because he needed more players in order to implement whatever his tactical idea was, we'll never know. I do agree that Ronaldo has a point about the Ranić appointment, but there's a time and a place for expressing those views. Whilst you're in the employment of someone, either as an employee or as a contractor, there are certain things that you can and can't do under that contract. They might be implicit terms or they might be implied terms. And I don't think you can slate the owners who are paying you or some of the decisions that they've made in regards to your line manager, for want of a better term, whilst you remain in their employment. I think when he leaves Manchester United, which is sooner rather than later, then of course he can express whatever views he wants. He can do a, a tell all at that point and say, their decisions weren't great. They were impersonal. They didn't know what they were doing. Fine, because you have no ties to the club. But whilst you're being paid by them, he's still being paid by them now. He's not suspended. I think there's an element of decorum and I think there's an element of contractual obedience that you have to follow. I th United are taking legal advice. They've come up with a statement to say that they will take the appropriate action 
necessary and relevant to the comments that Ronaldo's made in the interview. To me, that sounds like they feel he might be in breach of contract. This will be interesting to see what route they take. With regards to Ronaldo's grievances, I touched on this in my previous Cristiano Ronaldo video. I said that there's a possibility that some form of conversation took place. Either that's between the manager, Eric Ten Hag, and Cristiano Ronaldo, or Ronaldo and Manchester United management, whether that was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer or Ed Woodward at the time that he joined. Does his contract contain clauses about appearances, minutes, stature? Is there a gentleman's agreement? Is there something that's happened in the background that has now been renegated on that Ronaldo has a, almost an entitlement to feel aggrieved by? We don't know. That contract doesn't exist in the public domain. But even so, these are things that should be handled behind closed doors, in boardrooms, meeting rooms, managers' offices, between the parties involved or their legal representatives. I don't think he's got the justification, whilst he's still in their employment, to come out and say certain things. I think some of what he said is clearly emotional. He's probably been ill-advised in terms of what he can say, when he can say, and how he can say it. So I think this could get quite messy from a contractual perspective. There may be elements that he has been personally slighted. Maybe Manchester United have renegated on certain things. Equally, Eric Ten Hag might be looking at it and looking at, is he a disruptive influence? Is he narcissistic? Is he training at 110%? One of the things that Manchester United senior pros from when he was a youngster, which is what he spoke about in the interview, demanded. If you listen to Roy Keane and Gary Neville and players like that, they'll tell you that some of United's training ground matches were more intense than some of their Premier League matches. They went at 110%. Is Ronaldo training like that? If the answer is no, maybe Eric Ten Hag has dropped him for footballing reasons, for attitude reasons, for how intense is he training? How, how much does he want it? How much is he prepared to give? Was he, I don't want to say in holiday mode, but was he doing an element of self-preservation to not get injured for the World Cup? We don't know. So there's possibly two sides to that. But I think, in the main, when he's criticising the club, when he's criticising the ownership, when he's criticising some of their decisions, he can't do that publicly whilst he is employed by them. He did make some very good points about the lack of investment, the lack of strategy, the lack of foresight, the lack of football understanding, and the lack of moving Manchester United forward. If you look at a club like Leicester, they won the league, they won the FA Cup. They haven't won more trophies than Manchester United since Alex Ferguson left. Yes, they've been league champions and United haven't. But the owners have invested in the infrastructure of the club. They had a model in terms of how they were going to go and recruit, but they made sure that the facilities and the actual fundamentals of that club were at a level to maintain training, standards, fitness, emotional well-being, all the rest of it. Ronaldo probably has a point there. He probably also has a point that if you have a squad that was okay and you sprinkle some world-class elements over the top, like himself, like Varane, like Sancho, he probably is right to suggest that they should have had more of a sustained challenge last season. But again, whilst you're in the employment under contract of an individual or an organisation, you can't publicly make slanderous or defamatory comments in public. You know, there's contracts and provisions and clauses which prevent this. So I think either he didn't know or he's done it through complete ignorance or as the likes of Jamie Carragher have said, he has done this with a very specific conscious thought, a wish, a mechanism to get sacked. That would in incur possibly a financial penalty or possibly a mutual termination without some form of remuneration. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he just wants to become a free agent. Maybe he's already sounded out some clubs that if there's no signing on fee, no transfer fee, maybe he would sign for them. These are all subjective things, but it might make a, an element of, of sense. He said that he had several offers, not just the Saudi offer of over 300 million that he turned down. Perhaps those clubs have come back and said, look, no signing on fee, reduced weekly salary, no transfer fee, let's talk. So maybe he's trying to negotiate and position himself 
for that to happen. I think a lot of the general criticism is, is still valid in the sense of if you're a playing staff member, if you're a player playing for a club, you are paid to take directions from the coach, whether you like them or not. If the coach says, I want you on for 30 seconds, you have to strip off and come on the pitch. That is what you're paid to do. You're paid to give your all in training. You're paid to give your all on the pitch. If you're a star player and you're asked for an interview, depending on what the contract says, I would expect you to give interviews. Maguire has given interviews. De Gea has given interviews. We've heard from the likes of Diogo Dalot. We've heard from Marcus Rashford. Almost every player who's played minutes and has a good grasp of English has given interviews, but Ronaldo hasn't. When Ronaldo was given the captaincy, whether or not you agree or disagree with that decision, he should have come out after the game and given an interview. He didn't do that. Whether that's, again, in his contract or not, there are certain things that you would expect. His conduct and his decisions have brought the club, at times, into disrepute. None of what he said in the interview gets away from that. He will have performance and legal clauses within that contract, implicit and implied obligations on him, his conduct and what he can say or not say in public. It's telling that Manchester United said quickly that they were going to be taking legal advice on this, and it's telling that they've said that they've started the appropriate action in response to this. We're no closer to knowing what's going to happen, although probably there's going to be a passing of the way sooner rather than later. Something that Ronaldo alluded to during the interview. I think the whole thing was in bad taste. I think the whole thing was a self-serving exercise. There are some really good insights there into his character, into his thoughts, into what drives him, into some of the opinions and things that he's had to go through in the last six to 12 months. These are all fantastic things and I encourage him to share those. Anything to do with his personal circumstance, no problem whatsoever. Encouraging communication and sharing between him and, and fans is no problem whatsoever. It's just the airing of anything that crosses a line when it is inappropriate to do so. I can't believe that his advisors have allowed him to get, to wa to get away with this unless there is some sort of agreement in place with other clubs and they strongly feel that they're going to get released from their contract to, to instigate that move. I can't see why you would potentially walk such a trepidous legal line unless something like that was already in the background. Anyway, we can only speculate. A lot of my feedback and thoughts from the previous video I stand by. I know that Gary Neville and others who have publicly expressed some criticism and disappointment with him stand by those comments. Let's wait and see. Let's genuinely hope that he does have a good World Cup because a good World Cup for him means a good World Cup for Portugal, which is another good team, which means more exciting matches. I think this World Cup needs exciting matches so that we can talk about the football more than anything, but we have to watch this space. I'd love to know what your thoughts are about the Ronaldo interview now that the opportunity for all parts to be viewed are out there to be consumed. Let me know on the socials. Let me know in the comments below. Catch you soon.